Back to My Garden, Episode 22. Welcome to Back to My Garden. Discover your passion for gardening. Here's Dave Ledoux. What's the hottest trend in gardening? I think the hottest trend is aquaponics. Can you really grow a massive garden powered by fish? Find out more and discover the secrets to building fish-powered gardens at www.backtomygarden.com front slash fish. Attention gardeners, do you love perennial flowers? Get a free online catalog and 10% off your first order of bulbs at Bloomin' Bulbs. I set up a special link just for podcast listeners. Go to www.backtomygarden.com front slash bulb for your special bonus. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world when you listen to this. I'm Dave Ledoux, and welcome to another edition of Back to My Garden. And today we have an exciting guest. Holly and her husband Joey live in southeast Wisconsin. She is the visionary leading force behind a new digital magazine as well as an awesome YouTube producer. Her website, uh, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com, they're approaching a half a million views on YouTube and climbing. She's passionate about vegetable gardening, simple home living and home canning. Uh, has some interesting stuff on growing indoors for those of us that live in winter climates with year-round gardening ideas. She speaks at garden expos across the Midwest, and she's an award-winning state-level home canner. I want to welcome to the show Holly Baird. Holly, welcome to Back to My Garden. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Very exciting to talk to you. I want to get to know you a little bit, and I'm sure our listeners do as well. Uh, Holly, take a minute or two and just share with us a little bit about your background. Sure. I um, I grew up in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I grew up in the in the city. And um, I, my, you know, we had a small four by four vegetable garden, and we did a lot of composting. And then after, and Joey grew up on about a thousand acre grain and cattle farm, and he did a lot of gardening. And you know, we had met, and then. We kind of combined our, our gardening and compost experience and um, kind of took off from there. We decided to, um, we had a Facebook page that we started because we noticed that there was really no Facebook community just for, I guess, more Midwestern vegetable gardeners. And our information can be applied to any vegetable gardener. It really doesn't matter if you live in Wisconsin or the Midwest. But we wanted to kind of start a community there, and we did that. And then I had won a video camera through... Um, a job I was working and you know I said we were getting a lot of these questions that we couldn't necessarily answer just by writing it out it would be better for people to see a video so we decided to start doing the videos then fantastic and you've just done amazing things on social media let's make sure everybody now if you're driving in your car please keep both hands on the wheel uh, <laughs> I'll put the links in the show notes so Holly's main website is www dot the wisconsin vegetable gardener dot com and make sure you follow holly on twitter very active twitter feed it's at t-h-e-w-i-v-e-g-g-a-r-d-e-n-r did i get it right yes yeah your twitter is uh short form for the wisconsin vegetable gardener there are all the main links to social media is on holly's site including your awesome youtube channel uh you know your three hundred and eighty thousand views or something like that yes and it keeps growing yeah we have a, a lot of views that's for sure yeah what i loved about it is the first video i saw was a a, a challenging moment with your drowned peppers yeah yeah our poor peppers we had a lot of rain in june and the beginning part of July, which we kind of knew was going to happen a little bit. So, and I don't know, we put them, there's part of our garden that kind of just dips a little bit lower. And I don't think we necessarily thought about that when we were planning where we were putting the peppers and they got a little waterlogged and um, just, they're a little yellow, but they'll, I think they'll, they'll be okay. You know, Holly, I've had the privilege of talking to a lot of gardeners down in Texas, Arizona, California. <laughs> and they're dry as dust. Oh. So to talk to a gardener getting too much rain, that's something <laughs> a little different. I'm sure, yeah. It's, uh, well, you get all four seasons, right, in a big way. Oh, definitely, yeah. There's definitely 
a big, you know, separation of all four seasons. Mm -hmm. I want to go back because you're very experienced and it sounds like uh, Joey knows his way around the dirt as well. What was it like when you first started your first garden together as a couple? What were some of the challenges and what was it like? I remember that at first we started kind of small. I think it was about, um, about 10 by 16 Maybe a little bit bigger, so it wasn't too big, but it was about 10 feet by 16 feet. And, um, I, you know, that was the biggest garden that I had ever grown. So, and I remember we were, you know, we were turning the soil over and we were getting stuff planned out and everything. And I remember I felt a little bit overwhelmed, but Joey had, you know, more experience. I think the biggest challenge was he's from southern Illinois, which is almost close to Kentucky, so it's a little bit south, it's a little bit warmer there. And I had to keep explaining to him that Wisconsin has a really unpredictable springs. So it might be 70 degrees one day in, you know, say, end of April, but then the next day you could get a freeze. So I remember that was the biggest challenge, and he's still, you know, it's been, let's see, I think five years now that we've been back up here gardening and stuff. And sometimes he still wants to push it, and I have to remind him, you know, it's you don't know what's going to happen with spring sometimes. You have to follow, you know, when the last frost day is predicted and kind of go from there. Do gardeners in Wisconsin in late March, 1st April, you know that first warm, sunny day in early spring, do they lose their mind and go crazy? Uh, some some people do, yeah. <laughs> uh, one, one year we planted, I think it was onions. Yeah, it was onions way too early and they didn't do very well and you know then you end up kicking yourself for it but it happens and you get but you get excited because you've had this winter and you're like oh I can finally be in the garden I can finally plant something I can finally you know grow something outside and as tempting as it is I just you know I just know in my personal experience that spring is tricky here and it's it's sneaky and you don't you know I, I mean we even had fear of frost one time around Memorial Day weekend a couple of years ago. So you have to you have to pay attention and you just have to be aware. I love learning from the old timey gardeners from the days gone by and they always say the after the full moon in May from yeah. for where I am, like the May long weekend. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's nothing more discouraging than that early snowstorm in May when it like half sleet, half snow, half ice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. And so you've been gardening together for five years. Uh, what do you love most about gardening? I just enjoy being outside and just starting, you know, just watching the whole process, starting it from seed. We start our seeds inside and we start things actually as early as January and then inside. And then just, you know, throughout the whole process, it's kind of fun when you, you have your seedlings growing and then, you know, uh, and then come, you know, mid-May, you feel like you're being bombarded by ceilings. But, <laughs> you know, moving them outside, getting them planted, just kind of the, the whole, I just enjoy the whole process from seed to, to end. Is, it just is always amazing to me that the, we can grow these beautiful vegetables from just these tiny little seeds, and I think it's great. I understand. February, it's 10 below, and you're dreaming about seedlings. Yes. <laughs> do you use the windowsill with the sun? Do you have a, like a, sh- a sunny corner? Do you have a, a light? We we use some of the window from the sun. We have a where our little seedling area is. We have a west facing facing window, and then we also have some grow lights as well. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. I'm nodding along. For those of you driving, I'm nodding along. We have something similar. We're on the same latitude as Cleveland, Ohio, so okay. I'm sure you know your weather's not that different from Chicago, is it? No, we're just a little bit north. We're I'm, we're only about two hours north of Chicago. So Got yeah. it. Good, good, good. Some people garden just for the flowers and the beauty, and some for the vegetables and the eating and the practicality, and some people for the outdoors and the fresh air. Some people garden because it literally recharges their emotional batteries. What's it like for you, or is it a combination of everything? It's a combination. You know, it's um, we, we enjoy to can and put up the food, so we garden for that reason. Um, for me, I think it helps with, you know, not that I necessarily have a lot of stress, but I think it just helps to feel relaxed and it gives you a sense of accomplishment and it gives you, um, you know, for, for Joey and I, it gives us, it gives us something to do together and to work on together. And it, 
it's so it's it's a combination of pretty much everything just you know having um the production of it and then also having a, a hobby for us to enjoy together that is pretty much something that i'm sure we'll do for the rest of our lives and um and then also just for me just getting out there being outside i love to be outside and it's nice to be outside and doing something that you really enjoy nice now holly I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about canning because you're very good at it. You're very experienced. We have a lot of listeners who live in apartments with little patio gardens. This is very daunting. Like, how does a brand new person get into canning? Well, the biggest thing is is to find good resources. So there's websites like the the ball. It's called the ball website. I think it's it's, yeah, it's freshpreserving dot com. And Ball is the maker of the canning jars. And they have good information on there. Um, You know, there's a lot of groups on Facebook. But the thing to keep in mind is that you want to find a recipe that's been um, created within the book or, you know, even updated within about the past 15 years because a lot of things have changed. I I got into it because of Joey. His mom and his grandmother canned. So he kind of taught me some things. And then I took some classes through my local rec department. And that way I learned more techniques, more of the science behind it, more, you know, just how to get more refined on things. So, if, you know, if there's a class that you can take at, through a rec department or a community center or anything like that, you know, it's, it's good to do that. And our videos, when we show our canning, I try to, you know, be as technical as possible and try to explain why things are done a certain way. Canning is a science, and there's, you know, there's low-acid foods, there's high-acid foods. So you want to keep that in mind. You want to make sure you're canning the correct way so that it's safe. Mm -hmm. It's that time of season, too. I mean, we've been coming back from the store, and I'm, like, carrying six jugs of distilled water on every trip. Yeah. Do you have to stockpile distilled water? We we don't worry about that because we have well water. Ah. So we are lucky in that sense that we don't have to worry about the chlorine or the fluoride magic good tip now we actually dug up beets this morning we're going to do a little batch just to test the beets what is your all-time favorite to can you know i love canning salsa and i love canning pickled beets i just enjoy if i can we try to can as much pickled beets as we we possibly can and i'll even go to the farmer's market and get more beets to, to can than what we what we grow and because it's just so nice, you know, in the middle of winter, just to open up a can of pickled beets, and then you have that with your dinner. It's, you know, it's just a really good reminder of summer. Oh, man, I'm just nodding along. We are so in <laughs> sync. My wife transcribes these podcasts, and we just love the beets. Now, last year we did two kinds, a white kind and, you know, the classic red kind. Okay. Um, I'm crazy for salsa. And I've been bragging on this new pepper that I'm growing. It's called a naga. And it's the third hottest pepper on earth. Oh, wow. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. It comes with a warning label. <laughs> but we have some red rocket chilies, and we have some jalapenos growing. And I, I feel I, I'm big on heat, so I'm really fortunate this year. Yeah. Yeah, that's the big thing is a lot of people grow the really hot peppers. And we're not big on heat. I usually don't even add any, any sort of spicy peppers to the salsa unless I'm making it, you know, for somebody who wants it you know, more spicy, but I typically, we keep it pretty mild. We did something called cowboy candy last year, which is basically uh, sweet pickled jalapenos. And you can, you you can really do any spicy pepper, I guess. And we don't really enjoy it very much. So we've been giving it to people that enjoy more of the the hot foods. Sound, yeah. Here, take this. Start giving away cans of fire. (laughs) Beautiful. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you, this season, because I've been looking on some of your YouTube videos, and I know your peppers got too much rain, and I love the fact that you share challenges openly, because everyone looks at you and says, oh, she's so experienced. Everything is wonderful, and candy cotton, and no you know, princesses, and nothing ever goes wrong. Can you share a humorous story with the listeners when something went drastically wrong in your garden, what I call a catastrophic oopsie? Um, actually, that happened to us this spring. We planted some cauliflower, broccoli, and Brussels sprouts. 
and we must have labeled the seedlings wrong or something. I don't know what happened. I don't know if we labeled them wrong, if we planted them, you know, we started them wrong, if we labeled them wrong, or if we planted them, we didn't plant them where we thought we planted them. But we, we're we still finding, like, that we have Brussels sprouts growing where we thought we had broccoli planted. So, or, or the opposite. So it was kind of funny that, you know, we have all this experience and we're so careful to label everything, and then we totally botched that. But it happens. And I think we did mention it in one of our videos that we did that and we feel it's always good to show these mistakes because that's everybody makes mistakes you know and you watch a lot of these youtube videos and it's like you said it seems like everything's all perfect and and well and you know they have the perfect garden and everything you know is lined up great but it's not you know it's not like that and we like to show that because you know people can relate to us then Mm -hmm. how do you cook your brussels sprouts because I've had some disastrous recipes, and my wife and I have learned a, a way that works for us. How do you cook your Brussels sprouts? We usually just saute them in some butter and garlic. Yeah. Pretty much it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't boil them till they're little gray rubber balls. No. Yeah. No, we don't. We try not to <laughs> over overcook our vegetables, though. It's always funny when people listen to these podcasts. The flower gardeners especially go, oh, I would never grow Brussels sprouts, but... Some people love them. Right. right. Well, let's let's talk about your garden this season. Um, what are you growing? What are you most proud of, and what is frustrating you? Well, we grow a variety of different things. We grow, you know, the pretty basic stuff: tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, winter squash, summer squash, and um, yeah, that's pretty much the basics. And then we do carrots, beets, radish. Well, radishes are done now. We do lettuce in the spring and then sweet peas in the spring. I guess we're most proud of at this point are tomato plants. We had kind of exhausted our soil and we didn't realize that we had exhausted our soil last summer. So we didn't have the best tomato crop and then we kind of rejuvenated our soil and now our tomatoes are looking really, really good. So I'm pretty proud of that. And our corn is looking good too. Last summer we didn't do so well with the corn either. So that's what we're most proud of um i guess our peppers are the most frustrating is one of the biggest things and we never have good luck with broccoli but yet we still keep trying to grow it because we hope that maybe one day it'll be good but it it never works out for us but um we kind of assume that's going to (laughs) happen you're growing broccoli for practice that's good pretty much we, we have friends that grow beautifully you know not you know within the area so I don't know. We don't. We don't know what's going wrong. But I, like I said, we just do that. But yeah, um, like I said, our tomato crop is is something that's looking really good. And then our, like I said, our frustrating thing is just those peppers. The the water for it, you know, the, they just got a little too waterlogged. You know, Holly, you dropped a little bit of a, a tidbit there, and I grabbed my pen to write a note down. You said exhausted your soil and you rejuvenated it. To grow some tomatoes. Can you talk a little bit about this rejuvenation strategy? Yeah, we added, um, we brought in some leaf compost. This is compost that's made from leaves and it's just pure leaves. So, and the thing about leaves, people don't realize is that the trees, they get all these nutrients from deep within the earth and then it's basically put into their leaves. So, when you have leaf compost, it's just full of rich nutrients. So we, you know, we amended that into the soil. We amended our own, you know, compost from our compost pile. And we amended that in. And then we added some organic fertilizer in. And then we tried these methods that we've done for a couple years now of how to get beautiful tomatoes. And it includes things like Epsom salt, whole grain cornmeal, and then spraying your tomato plants with a combination of molasses and liquid seaweed. And this helps the tomato plants as well. But the soil part, like I said, was adding that leaf compost, adding some, you know, fertilizer to it, and then adding our own, you know, homemade compost to it. And it really helped the soil. That's like uh, Grandma's secret recipe there. Cornmeal, Epsom salts, liquid seaweed. Did you say molasses? Yes, yes. Molasses helps basically to to strengthen the, the stems of the tomato plants and kind of wards off some of the bad bugs and liquid seaweed raises the sugar content of your tomato plants so that if there's a 
early frosts in the fall, then they'll have a higher sugar content and they'll be less susceptible to, to a light frost. Sometimes you get that light, you know, you get like that one light frost early in the fall and then you have kind of like an Indian summer. That, that tends to happen and this will help prevent that. Brilliant. Uh, do you have a philosophy on the suckering on the tomatoes? We don't cut them. And a lot of people do. We just feel that if the tomato wants to grow that, we're going to let it grow it. We're, since we're, you know, since we're so organic, we're kind of, in a sense, I guess, low maintenance in many ways. That, and we have, I think, about 50 tomato plants. So we would, could spend all day cutting the suckers, but we just kind of let it grow how it wants to grow. Brilliant. Brilliant. Let's take a minute to thank our sponsors and then come back and play five quick questions. What's the secret weapon of top-level gardeners? It's Haven brand Moo Poo Tea. What? I'm serious as an onion. Have your greatest garden ever. Check it out at www.backtomygarden.com front slash moo. This episode of Back to My Garden is sponsored by Coffee Royalty. Can you really lose 5, 10, even 20 pounds or more just by switching your coffee or tea? Find out how to drink it for free at www.backtomygarden.com front slash coffee. I just glanced at the clock. I thought we were just getting started and we're running out of time on our half hour. Now's the time in the show when we play our favorite game called Five Quick Questions. This is where you get to drop wisdom and share experience with the listeners. Are you ready to play? Yeah. All right. Question number one. In your opinion, what stops most people from trying gardening? I think they think that they need to have a lot of space and a lot of time. But you can grow a lot of food in a 4 by 8 4 by 4 area or even in you know containers on a patio or deck as long as you... Um, you know, you can grow in one square in one square foot. You can grow a one tomato plant, two pepper plants. I think it's like sixteen carrots. I think, and then I think it's like twelve beets or something. So you can grow a lot in a small space, and you don't need a ton of room and a ton of time. It's something that you could work on, you know, a couple hours in the evening or even on a Saturday morning or something. I think that's actually from gardening. Fantastic. Everyone's going, oh, man, I better go check out Holly's website. That's www.thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. I told you this is going to be an awesome show. Tons of wisdom. Uh, Holly, you have learned from books, classes, and experienced gardeners, plus your own trial and error. What is the best gardening advice that you've ever received? Uh, Grow what you know you're going to eat. Because if you grow stuff that you don't enjoy, you're not going to enjoy trying to grow it. So if you enjoy tomatoes and grow all the tomatoes you want, you know, and also another one is that if something keeps failing for you, then, and I should take my, I guess we should take my own advice, but if something keeps failing for you, then just stop growing it and just get it from the farmer's market because you'll probably be happier that way. Yeah, brilliant. (laughs) We're not picking on the poor broccoli, are we? Yeah. (laughs) The internet is a massive place now with tons of great gardening resources. If you had just two websites to share with a new beginner gardener, what would those websites be? I would say check out your local university extension office. Those university extensions have great information for where you live. So if you have, like for us, it's the University of Wisconsin. We have the agricultural, horticultural extension and they have you know different information and it's you know centered to where you live so we get a lot of information from there and then another website let's see um would have to be you know our website has a lot of good information obviously and then um i would try to find something more local to you i know the bonnie plants website has a lot of good information too on how to grow things how to combat things um you know, reasons why people use stuff like Epsom salt in their gardens. So I would say Bonnie plants is, is a good one as well. Is there two ends there? B-O-N-N-Y plants? It's B-O-N-N-I-E. I-E. Okay, Bonnie plants. So, and uh, folks who are listening, I'll put all these links in the show notes for sure, bonnieplants.com. Oh, and you also mentioned freshpreserving.com. I'll put that in too. Yes. Uh, I love to read new books about gardening. Can you recommend a great gardening book that you think I should read? The, you know, 
the one that we always say, tell people, especially if they are focused on how much space they have, is the square foot gardening method. That's a good book because it's, it tells you different, um, you know, methods for how to set up your garden and if you're, especially if you need the space. And then there's another book. It's called the, what is it called? It's called the Victory Garden or Victory Gardening. I'm sorry, I forgot to write it down. But that one goes through kind of vegetable by vegetable and it explains how to grow it, tips and things, and and then it talks about the areas as well. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that square foot gardening book, you know, my wife picked that up, I don't know, a decade ago and mm-hmm. just changed everything. It's it's almost like uh, you. everyone calls a photocopy or a Xerox machine or they call it a, a tissue a Kleenex. Square, right. square foot gardening is a brand. Yes, I think so. Fantastic. And number five, and you can make this a two-parter. What is one thing that you want to try to grow next year, and is what is one thing that every gardener should try to grow next year? Well, um, we tried, let's see, we tried uh, Scarlet Runner beans this year. That's what we tried new this year. And they, they're they doing okay. But one thing I always encourage gardeners to grow is, like I said, things that they're going to eat. But it's always good to kind of have the basics tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, and then a lot of people don't think about growing beans because they think about the space, but you can grow pole beans and then you can trellis them and it doesn't take up as much space. So, and they're, you know, they're delicious. So I think that's one thing I always encourage people to do is to try the basics and then try something else that you can trellis because if you're concerned about space, then you you can trellis it. For for us, um, I don't know. We we keep, we've been trying to kind of work on the corn and get it more um, more experience with growing it. You know, we try to grow an organic variety. So I think we're going to continue with that next year. Is just working on growing the corn and getting better at it. Do you buy your seeds locally or online from one of the organic houses? We buy them. We get ours from DollarSeed.com. And then whatever, um, whatever. If we don't have find anything there, or if we can't find something there, then we get stuff from Baker Creek. Yeah, that's rare seeds. Yeah, rare yeah. seeds. Website is incredible. <laughs> My wife is like on it and just shouts out, "Hey, how about something from India or England?" You know, and <laughs> she's going country by country. But if you're looking for just basic, you know, organic and heirloom variety seeds, Dollar Seed is good because. The seeds are only a dollar a pack, and they have a lot of variety as well. If you're not looking for something super rare, just kind of, you know, standard seeds and dollar mm-hmm. seeds. I loved your vertical gardening idea with the pole beans on the trellis. Yes. And everybody can do that. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Holly, our time is rapidly running away from us here. I want everyone listening to head over to Holly's and Joey's website at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. Subscribe to their YouTube channel. That way, when Holly puts up a new video, you'll get a notification from Google. Follow them on Twitter at the W-I-V-E-G-G-A-R-D-E-N-R. Lots of good uh, stuff you can share on social media. Holly, you've been an amazing guest. I took like half a page of notes, which I don't know why, because I have it on audio now, so I'm going to go back and study my notes. I want to give you the last word. Do you have a pearl of wisdom or a note of encouragement for our gardening listeners? I would say just just keep trying. You know, you, gardens aren't perfected overnight or even in a season, so keep trying, try different things. You know, get good information and ask questions. You know, we are more than welcome. If you have a question, we have a contact us button right on the right side of our page. I believe it's in red. So, yeah, just push that button or come to our Facebook page, ask questions, and we're more than happy to help you out. Awesome. Holly, thank you so much for being on Back to My Garden. Thank you for having me.